Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode two of The Forge of Freedom. I'm your host, Alex Uli, and today we're going to be talking about why freedom. Last week, we touched on the topic just a little bit, and I talked about how uh, there can be no virtue without freedom because anything that is not freely chosen, anything that's imposed, can't be said to be virtuous because if it's not a choice, uh, then there is no good in it. You didn't have any say in in the choice or the decision. So there can't be virtue without freedom. But that's not the whole story. So I want to talk, get into the topic why freedom in a little bit more detail here today. Just a reminder, uh, the podcast can be found on all your most popular podcast streaming services. Uh, it can be found on Spotify, uh, Apple Podcasts, uh, Google Podcasts, Amazon Podcasts now, as well as a few other uh, streaming sources. Uh, it's also available on YouTube, Rumble, and Odyssey. If you'd rather watch the podcast, it's available there in video form as well. So I'm using today the terms uh, freedom and liberty interchangeably. And I talked a little bit about the virtue aspect of freedom, but I want to get more in depth here today. One school of thought is that decision making should be more centralized, that the government should be making decisions and imposing those decisions on individuals. The argument is that if you live, leave people to themselves, people will consolidate power, they'll, they'll limit competition, they'll exploit each other. And because of that, when decisions need to be made, they should be made centrally by a government that makes the decisions for everyone. But there's also another school of thought that says decisions should be made individually, that if you leave people alone, they will disseminate power They'll promote competition. They'll create and disseminate wealth. And this school of thought says that decision-making should be left with the individual, and people should be free to make whatever decisions they want for themselves, and that the role of government, if any, should be restricted to preventing people from harming each other, but otherwise leaving them alone. So why freedom? Why do I think that this second school of thought is the, is the correct one? That uh, we should not have a government making decisions from the top down uh, for, the, for the citizens of that, of the, uh, that government. Um, why is individual autonomy and decision making superior to a centralized authority imposed from the top down? Well, there's a few aspects to this. And one thing I'd like to point out at the outset is that there's this economic freedom index from the Fraser Institute. And the Fraser Institute looks at all sorts of things such as how government, how much government spending uh, there is in a society, uh, how much transfer of wealth is going on, is the government taking money from one group of people and giving it to another how much regulation is there? How much rule of law is there? Are people protected from other people harming them? And they get into a lot of detail trying to determine how much freedom uh, exists in particular countries. And they rate it in this economic freedom index. And one of the things they look at is the poverty level in these various countries. And they compare uh, states in which decision making is more centralized to states to states in which decision making is done in a more individual uh, basis. And what they found is that for the years 1981 through 2014, in every single year, with the exception of three years, uh, the poverty rate in the states that allowed people to make more decisions for themselves was lower than in the states in which government made more decisions for the people. And if you convert the difference in poverty rates, and this is the interesting part, if you convert the difference in poverty rates to human beings, the difference 
is 3 million people. In other words, if over this period the centralized decision-making states had the same low poverty rate that the individual decision-making states had, there would have been 3 million fewer Americans living in poverty. So this is just one metric that we have to gauge how effective uh, these states are at stemming poverty. You know, these states that have more centralized authority versus decentralized authority, that is more authority in the individual. And what the Fraser Institute found in this Economic Freedom Index is that in the years from 1981 to 2014, if the states with more centralized decision making had implemented the policies of the freer states, there would have been 3 million fewer Americans living in poverty. That's hard to imagine, uh, the number of people and the effect that, it's, that it had on those, those people. Um, so there, there's one example of why freedom. Uh, it, you, can, you can measure the difference, and the Fraser Institute has done that. But I also think about the places where people are less free, the, the ones that we think of more commonly. Uh, I've seen people who don't, don't have freedom, certain freedoms anyway, and, and they yearn for that freedom. They crave it. I think about China um, and the lack of the, the freedom to speak there and the, censor, the censorship that goes on with their internet in particular. Uh, people your, in China yearn for that information and they take all these steps to try to bypass the firewalls that are put in place to find information, to find the truth. And the people there want to know the truth. They want to know what's happening in the world outside of China. Uh, you think about North Korea and uh, the tyrannical dictatorship that they have there and the amount of malnourishment that they have there and the misallocation of resources and the tendency of North Korea to engage in um, war tactics and war sort of... Uh, most of the time, thankfully, uh, more war bluster, okay? But North Korea doesn't have a lot of trading partners. And where there's less trade, there's less uh, mutually beneficial exchange, there is more of this sort of violence and threatening behavior. You think about the Soviet Union uh, before uh, the fall, the end of the Cold War, and Eastern Germany. And the, the folks in Eastern Germany and the Soviet Union, they, they lived in incredibly harsh, con harsh conditions and afraid of persecution. Uh, they did not have the abundance of food and groceries that we had in the, in the Western world. And uh, with the fall of the Soviet Union and the Berlin Wall being torn down, you can barely recognize the difference between Eastern Germany or what used to be Eastern Germany and uh, the Western Bloc. So the Eastern part of Berlin and Eastern Germany uh, took on the character of the Western part almost immediately upon the fall of the wall because the people there craved the abundance, the resources, the freedom that existed in the West. You think about uh, Haiti and Honduras and Ecuador and all the people who flee from those countries to find freedom and to find places with more wealth and more abundance and more freedom. Uh, you think about the U.S. during lockdown and how we seem to be living for the sake of survival. And that a lot of people came to this realization that this is not what life is about. Life is about living. It's about seeing other people, seeing your friends, speaking together, meeting together, eating together, worshiping together. Uh, it's about being out in the world and engaging in the things that you're good at and being with one another. 
and you could see how much pushback there was during the lockdown to the sorts of uh, draconian measures that were taken in certain states. And thankfully, there were, were there were sort of refuges of freedom during the lockdowns. So, and and now you can see after the lockdowns, not just in the U.S., but worldwide, there's been pretty significant economic calamity. Governments tried to boost up their economies by printing money, by providing so-called stimulus, and now we're feeling the, the effects of that and in inflation and stagnation and unemployment. And now we're, we're having to feel the pain of higher interest rates to counteract those measures that were caused by the lockdowns and less freedom. Uh, so I think what we can say, both from the Fraser uh, Institute Economic Freedom Index and also from these other examples that we've talked about, is that where there's more freedom, there's more economic prosperity. But it's not just economic prosperity that we care about. Something that it, Freedom is something that we crave because it helps us flourish as individuals. And likewise, it helps us flourish as a society because it helps promote the peaceful, ex peaceful exchange of goods rather than forceful interaction. Um, in fact, there was, a pair, there was a study by a pair of researchers at Stanford University, and they found that by looking at economic and war data, that a country that had more trading partners was less likely to engage in war. And I think this is true for individuals and society at large, where there is more voluntary, mutually beneficial interaction. Uh, there is more peace, more prosperity, and more happiness. And that sort of demonstrates, from an economic perspective, the power of the free market. So freedom creates less poverty, more economic prosperity, and more peace. But like I said, it's not just not just that. Freedom is also right. And what do I mean by that? This, this sounds circular. I'm saying, why freedom? Well, because it's right. It's right because it stems from the natural order of the, word, the world. Every person is unique and born with the natural right to live their life as they see fit free from the aggression of others, including through government. And that stems from this idea of self-ownership, which just means that no person has a right to another person's body, labor, or the fruits of that other person's labor. No other person has a superior claim to your body. So you may say, well, we don't truly own our bodies, especially if you're a religious person. God, God owns our bodies. But this idea of self-ownership is with respect to other people, other humans. No other person has a superior claim to your body, to your labor, or to the fruits of your labor. And from this basic idea, from this notion of self-ownership, there are lots of ideas and notions that follow from that. How does self-ownership impact our view of the war on drugs, of taxation, of the war on terror, of the right to privacy, of the right to keep and bear arms, the right to free speech, the right to worship as you see fit? How does this self-ownership, this autonomy, impact our view on those things? And how does that affect our view on government and their engagement? in those activities. Think about this for a moment. Government is predicated on the idea that individuals cannot govern them themselves. We say that government is necessary because people cannot govern themselves, but on the other hand, we say that people can govern 
others. How can this be? This seems contradictory. Some would say that this is why it's important to elect the right sorts of people, the noble ruler, as Plato's Republic discussed. But I think this is a flawed notion because it is exactly the sort of person that wants to rule others that we do not want in power. I think the idea of a noble government is somewhat oxymoronic in that there's no way to implement a foolproof uh, mechanism to allow good people to rule over others. And I think history demonstrates this, that governments, no matter how noble their origins, always devolve into tyrannical instruments for corrupt people to exercise power over others. Think about the worst atrocities that have ever been committed. Mao's Great Leap Forward in China led to the famine of millions of people. The Ukrainian Holodomor, again, a massive famine that stemmed from the centralized control of the means of production. Food literally could not be, enough food could literally not be produced to feed the people in Ukraine. Um, and the, the Soviet government um, basically collected all the food to give the appearance of prosperity in Moscow and other places throughout the Soviet Union at the expense of places like Ukraine, and millions of people starved because of it. Think about the world wars that we've had in the 20th century in Nazi Germany and all the people that died as a result of the dictatorship there. And that's just the 20th century. Today, like I said earlier, we've got the, the North Korean dictatorship uh, where there are countless human rights violations. We've got the Chinese Uyghur re-education camps. There's the lockdowns that we've had. Uh, and the list goes on. And all of these atrocities are committed by government. I think it's arrogant and conceited to believe that I or anyone as a government official can make choices that are in the best interest of others. The decentralized knowledge of each individual is the only way to function harmoniously and in a way that promotes human flourishing. Remember, the premise of government is that individuals cannot be trusted to govern themselves. So how can someone be trusted to make decisions for not only themselves, but hundreds, thousands, or millions of others? The individual is best suited, best situated to make decisions for their own life. And will everyone act in a way that's optimal? Of course not. People are fallible, but it's the best way forward. Freedom makes life worth living. The freedom to speak, the freedom to work, the freedom to use our skills and talents, the freedom to worship, the freedom to love, these are the things that make us happy and help us to flourish. It's what makes life worth living. So why freedom? Because not only does it promote economic well-being and prosperity and peace. It helps humans flourish and live a happy and fulfilling life. And that's why I'm doing this podcast. Because I want to fight for human flourishing, for freedom. Why stick my neck out to the criticism and discomfort? Because freedom is worth fighting for and it's something that's tremendously motivational 
and exciting for me to spread the word of freedom and to hope that others feel the same motivation that I do. Because ultimately, freedom only survives the onslaught of the power hungry if there are enough people hungry for freedom. Like I said in the first episode, um, when I quoted Ronald Reagan uh, in his speech, freedom is not passed on through the bloodstream. It is fought for and won generation after generation. And I hope you join me in that fight for freedom. Uh, Next week, we will discuss something that is near and dear to my heart uh, as a criminal defense attorney the so-called war on drugs. And I want to talk about how the principles of freedom and self-ownership apply to the war on drugs. Thanks for tuning in to The Forge of Freedom. And if you like the show, don't forget to like and subscribe. Remember, your actions matter, and you are The Forge of Freedom.